I saw my first drive-by shooting when I was just six. This kid, a grade above me, Timmy Markell, um, used to walk me and my brothers home from school. Mama couldn't afford to drive us to the elementary, and well, the bus didn't go anywhere near our place, so Tommy would take us every day. We had to pass through some rough neighborhoods, and Mama always told us to listen to everything that Tommy said to stay safe. The day it happened, my middle brother, Byron, was running ahead, and going down an alleyway that we normally avoid. Tommy was right at his heels, shouting and admonishing him. And then it, um... I don't want to hell. Sounded like the crack of lightning split through the air, collided with Tommy, sent him flying backwards. I remember seeing blood splattering out of his left eye, hearing the sound of his skull as it hit the pavement. And then watching as the car drove off. And all because he wore the wrong colors to school that day. Mama promised us that she would find someone else to um, get us to school. But like so many other things, it became empty words. I don't blame her, not even now. Raising three kids in the Bronx was hard. Rent alone ate most of her check for her first job. And little she made as a waitress covered our food and utilities. And sometimes we didn't even get one of those. We learned to survive, though. Only way we knew how. Since our days were spent at home rather than in classrooms without adult supervision, Byron, Trey, and I would get into a lot of trouble. It's not that we went looking for it, but the apartment was stuffy, claustrophobic, really. Staying there alone when Mama had to work felt like we were just you know, suffocating. I knew she wouldn't have approved of us sneaking out just to toss rocks at passing cars. But oftentimes the reason for our visits to the neighborhood were for any other reason entirely. Hunger. I can't really explain to you what that feels like. To be so hungry that a loaf of bread tossed aside can be appetizing. This is what my childhood memory has amount to. Scrounging through trash and trying to find anything to help Mama. Most of the days we didn't even see her. Not even when we came home to sleep. I made it my responsibility as the oldest to try and make our visits to the street far and few between. But it's hard to say no to a crying seven-year-old. I wasn't ashamed to search for food in the dumpster. I actually thought that was necessary for our survival. I was... It was during one such afternoon that our lives changed forever. We had gone about six blocks from our house picking up littered Coke cans that we planned to recycle for spare change when Trey decided to run towards a nearby dumpster and take a peek inside. It had become so ordinary for us to do this that me and Byron didn't even scold him for doing so. A few seconds later, he was leaning over the edge of the dumpster. Our youngest brother let out a surprised yelp that made Byron and I come running. He stumbled off the cardboard box he had been standing on and started fumbling over his words. There's, there's a man in there, he said with a shaky voice. The two of us gave him a skeptical glance and Byron went to investigate. Jesus, what happened to this dude? He asked. Curiosity got the better of me and I stole a glance as well. The image of that man stuffed amid the garbage is something that I... I'll never erase. He was naked from the neck down. His head completely severed and his body covered in sores and cuts like his, like his skin started to decompose. From the middle of his chest, it looked like someone had taken a butcher knife and cut him straight down. Then used sewing thread to sloppily put him back together again. What is that? Byron asked, pointing to where his junk was supposed to be. It looked like someone had stuffed his body full of small duffel bags. And when his body had defecated for the final time, they had caused his organs to rupture out. 
Could be drugs, I suggested. Realizing that the style of this killing resembled similar gang incidents we had seen in the neighborhood. Cool, Byron said, stumbling into the dumpster to fish out the bags. I wanted to scold him, scream that he could get an infection or, or something far worse. But it all happened so quickly that he, he was back out before I could say a single word. Eagerly, my brother ripped open the bag and all of us found our jaws dropping as we saw stacks of hundred-dollar bills stowed inside. What the fuck? Trey said, trying to contain his excitement. We need to get him out of there! He could be loaded! Byron said. And suddenly, this was starting to feel like a very bad idea. I looked around the alleyway, curiously wondering if maybe whoever had done this to the headless stranger, he was still lurking about. Hurry up, I told him, not bothering to even express my concern. Byron curiously lifted up the lifeless corpse like it was some kind of ragdoll, and Trey grabbed the legs, doing his best not to puke as fresh maggots ate away at the man's thigh and leg. I helped him up over the edge of the dumpster, letting out a grunt as the dead weight hit me, and we all stumbled onto the street below. The body tumbled over the side of the grimy metal and flopped to the ground, sprawled out with more bodily fluids spilling out as it smacked against the concrete. I helped to get him over the edge of the dumpster, letting out a grunt as the dead weight hit me and we all stumbled onto the street below. The body tumbled over the side of the grimy metal and flopped to the ground, sprawled out with more bodily fluids spilling out as he smacked against the concrete. Oh, this is f disgusting, Trey said, holding a hand over his mouth. Quit your whining, Quaid. Did you bring your pocket knife? Byron asked me. I fumbled with it passing it through my middle brother as he climbed on top of the body and started to cut away at the flimsy threads that held the corpse together. Almost immediately, the body split apart, spilling out more wads of cash and jewels that had replaced vital organs. Holy shit, Byron said as his fingers sunk into the treasure trove excitedly. Trey, get your backpack, come on, before someone sees, he told me. I grabbed mine too and... All three of us hastily snatched up as much of the loot as we could. I can't carry any more, Trey whined as he struggled to zip up the pack. There's gotta be a few more pounds here, Byron said as he looked around the alley and started to drag the body behind the dumpster. We can come back for the rest, he decided. I didn't think that was a good idea, but I didn't argue with him. We ran home as quickly as we could without looking suspicious. It's probably strange seeing us carry those backpacks full of cash and jewels. Especially because they weighed us down, but we did our best to look normal. Inside our damp apartment, Byron was the first to show Mama. Look! We found enough to get us back into school! He exclaimed. As the treasure spilled out in front of our parents, I saw her face show a mix of emotions. Surprise, shock, fear, maybe a few more. This is... Baby, this is amazing. Where did you get this? She asked. We didn't tell her. And Byron made up a lie about doing a bunch of jobs for neighbors. Mama was in too much shock to ask further. She was trying her best not to cry. We all agreed we would go back to the dumpster later that evening when Mama went to work again. Once the coast was clear, I led the way. I wasn't thinking about anything else except getting those jewels. We found the dumpster easily enough. But the body was nowhere in sight. Shit! Somebody must have found him, Trey said. Maybe they stuffed him back in the dumpster, Byron suggested as he struggled to flip the lid open. From the street behind us, we heard the familiar sound of a trash truck, and I told him to hurry up. Byron was sticking his head into the dark trash bin, muttering that he couldn't see anything when suddenly he lost his footing and the boxes he was standing on fell away. The lid slammed on his neck and caught him hanging against the dumpster as my brother screamed and Trey and I ran to help him. The trash truck started to make a familiar noise, the long metallic arm of the vehicle extending to take hold of the edges of the dumpster. It was so dark the driver couldn't see that Byron was trapped. And suddenly the truck lifted my brother and the bin up in the air over the top of the visor, causing Byron to fall into the wide container at the back. Trey ran to the side to try to shout at the driver. As the loud noises of the gears and metal started to whine, and I ran to the back to see if I could catch sight of Byron. 
I watched in mortified horror as he struggled to push himself out of the trash. The container started the routine process of smashing the bags into compact sizes to give room for more debris, and before I could even scream, my brother was caught in the compactor. His own voice echoed around the entire city as he fell back and was smashed by the powerful loader. I heard his bones crack and shatter as his scream was covered over by the sound of the dump truck shutting. Trey managed to get the driver's attention, but it was... It was too little too late. Holy fucking Christ, a driver said as he saw what happened to Byron. The fuck is wrong with you kids? Why were you out here in the first place? He shouted. His own words trembling as he realized how horrendous the accident he had just caused was. I'm calling the police, he muttered. Dre and I panicked. We ran, even as the driver whipped out his phone. I'd, I don't think we stopped until we made it back to the apartment. When we finally got a chance to catch our breaths, both of us were too tired to even mourn our brother. And then we approached the steps of our flat and saw the door ajar and broken. Our hearts dropped even more than nightmare. It wasn't over. Inside, we saw a trail of blood that told a story. A vicious assault that crossed every part of our small home, and then we found Mama in the bedroom. She was beaten to a pulp, riddled with cut marks that resembled us of the corpse that we'd found, and had deep wounds that made her bleed out all over her mangled body. Around her were a few of the jewels that had been scattered during the scuffle. The rest missing. The rest of the evening was a blur. Exhausted and numb, we both curled up next to Mama and... And we wished this was all a bad dream. When the morning came, so did the cops. Somehow, the dumpster driver had managed to extract what was left of Byron and use that to find our address from his backpack. I never saw my brother again after that morning, both of us taken into foster care without the bat of an eye. I was adopted by a middle-class family and somehow managed to learn what it was like to live a normal life. And I walk my son to school now down the same rough streets to try and hold my head up high and say that I made it out of that life. I think about Trey and Byron and I wonder what would have happened had we never found that body. And then I see children my son's age wearing clothes that smell scourging for food amid the garbage. I know the answer. I give them warm food, or I, or I help them to a shelter. Secretly, I know that the same nightmare I lived through. It's one of them, one day, to get them out too. Because as horrible and frightening as those memories are, no matter how often they keep me awake at night, they all pale in comparison to the desperation these children are filled with. Every single day. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to say thank you for watching tonight's video. And also, I feel like this is something that really needs to be said. I'm pretty sure all of you are hearing this far too many times from far too many places, but during the current COVID-19 crisis that's going on, Make sure that you're practicing safe hygiene. Wash your hands. Don't touch your face. Don't lick random strangers on the street. I know that there's a lot of memes going around about it, but the biggest note is that although it may not be deadly for everyone, keeping it contained reduces the risk of death to everyone. So, important. Also, a number of conventions are currently closing around the United States. If there's a convention near you that I was intending to appear at, if there's an announcement of any kind of closures, I'll be sure to let all of you know on Twitter and the community page, so make sure you're following me there to get any information about that. 
And also, if you look in the description down below, you're going to find a group of my friends that are artists that make their living at events and conventions such as this. So I know all of them would appreciate any kind of support that you could show, especially if you feel like you're missing out on some of their artwork from missing out of these cons. So take a look there, see if there's anything you like. I know a lot of them work on creepypasta stuff, horror movie stuff, and generally anime and comic books that at least I love. So I hope that you do as well. And a very special thank you to everybody on that Patreon, patreon.com slash MrCreepyPasta, especially Ariel Torres, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Ken Lando Higuchi, Brianna Ventine Jensen, Chumpinski, The Red Oak Shield Virus, Sandy Barney, Asia, G Weevil 3, Diana Kraus, Steven Van Huss, Tristan Pelton, Nico Kao, The Ginger Bros, Dante Rao, Rafael Rodriguez, Don Muehlmeister, Eliminator 86, Steampunk Sinner, Caleb Dougal, Sky Harbor, The Homeless Bird 93, Gabrielle Undefined, Bobby Carmen, Liam Newman, Aaron Stormcrow, Bobby Jean Torgan, Dr. Strawberry, The Wormhole, Barbara Macedo, and Vic. Thank you guys so much, and if anyone would like to join them on that list, head over to patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. Here's hoping that you guys are loving the horror as much as I am. And sweet dreams.